welcome to our Connected Community session, the first session. We have both mentors and some um, producer groups here. Um, our three mentors for these sessions are Gavin Henderson, who's not here at the moment, he's in a board meeting. And we've got Dorcas from Oz African, who's sitting just here. We have Marlene from Maltese Down Under, who's sitting just here. Um, so your mentors are there to provide you with help, um, advice, knowledge. They're um, legacy producers, they've been producing for a long time, they know what they're doing, they know how to make great content. Um, so please use those resources. Um, and as everyone knows, we've got um, producer groups from Russian, Tamil and Vietnamese backgrounds, so welcome to everyone. Um, the purpose of these sessions are to, for producers to learn new skills um, and learn how to create content for us and um, submit content to us effectively. Um, uh, to connect with one another, to connect with groups, to share resources, to share knowledge. Um, and at the end, we'll talk about a way that we can all connect together via an online platform. We haven't decided on that yet. Um, and through today's session, we'll be talking about producer basics and camera and audio setups and uses. Um, so we'll start off with our producer basics. Um, so there's three main responsibilities you will be that you'll have as a producer. Um, they include with liaising with the C31 staff, um, writing documentation and sourcing and managing crew. Um, so the three people that you'll be talking to the most are Matt, our programming manager, um, myself, uh, I'm, who I'm an admin assistant, and Mitch is our digital manager. He's great to talk to about all things digital and online video and things like that. Um, all our contact information is in that booklet, as well as our C31 ingest email account and our programming email account. So you'll be receiving emails from all these different email accounts at some point. Um, so make sure that you look out for these. Um, so our responsibilities as a programming team are to accept your submitted programs, ingest your programs and ensure that they're suitable for broadcast, um, alloc allocate you time slots for your show to air and provide you with relevant contracts that need to be signed um, for you to air with us. Um, before you do begin airing, you need to write a program proposal. Um, this needs to be completed well before we give you a time slot. Um, it kind of gives us an idea of what your show is about and what it's going to include, whether it's going to be maybe interview segments or something that's more with a storyline. Um, and all this information will be in a program proposal kit. I'm going to send a big email out at the end of this session with all the documents that I reference. Um, it's a bit hard to print them all out, so that way you can reference them whenever you need to. Um, we also get you to sign a program broadcast license. So this is signed every 13 weeks, which um, are our programming seasons, they run in 13 weeks. Um, it kind of just outlines the terms and conditions with broadcasting with us, um, just to make sure that you're on track, that you're not breaching anything. I'm um, just kind of, you know, contracts are needed. Um, and then in this time as well, we, at the end of every season, we send an expression of interest um, to everybody who we have on our producer list. Um, you need to email back saying, yes, I'm interested in you know, whether, whether you are or not interested in um, producing for next season, just so we know to keep your time slot. Um, we also have guidelines that all of the shows need to adhere to. These are called the delivery specifications and advertorial guidelines. Um, the, the delivery specifications kind of talk about how to export your program, the technical aspects and editing wise. Um, we'll talk about that a lot more um, next week in editing, uh, and I'll send that document out this afternoon as well. Um, and our other main document, the advertorial guidelines, are kind of the do's and don'ts of advertising in programs. Um, so just to quickly go over it, we can't have sponsorship or paid segments, business addresses, business phone numbers, websites, email addresses, prices of goods or services, or any calls to action, so no buy this now, go to this place now, that sort of thing. Um, we have different rules as a community broadcaster compared to commercial broadcasters. Um, we can't have advertising within programs. It has to be clearly labelled, so we just kind of give this blanket coverage to everyone to make sure that it's uh, on the right way. Um, but you are allowed to put in your own website, your own email address and phone numbers, and your own social media, and um, any social media of your guests that might be on the show, but only personal, but no business social media. So you can direct your um, your audience to your website or your social media, and then once they're on there, you can post whatever you like. If someone's asked to sponsor a segment, you can post about their products or their services there. Um, with submitting episodes, we take them via two different methods, either on a USB or via FTP um, over the internet. Um, we, you can discuss with Matt and I which one you'd like to submit with. Um, our delivery deadlines are usually four episodes a month. 
Um, we do change this if you are creating a show that's kind of timely or relevant, like um, news content or sports shows or shows that involve events. Um, we can have this as one submission a week or one submission or two submissions every fortnight, sorry, just depending on what you're creating. Um, we have different durations as well for our time slots. So we have usually 30 and 60 minute time slots. It doesn't mean you're making a 30 minute program or a 60 minute program and we have to allow time for advertising. So for a 30 minute slot, we like you to create a program that's between 22 and 26 minutes and for a 60 minute slot between 48 and 53 minutes that gives us enough time to put um, advertising in between. Um, and we need you to submit these in segments. So it's three segments for 30 minutes, five segments for 60 minutes, and two segments for every 30 minutes after that. Um, the segments should be about the same length. They don't have to be exact, but you can cut things where you feel it kind of makes sense. Um, so anywhere between seven and eight minutes for segments really, really good. Um, we do have specific naming conventions um, and other bits and pieces that'll be in the document, and we'll talk about it next week as well. Um, generally, as a producer, you might want to make documentation to help you and your crew get through your shoots. Um, so things like scripts, shooting schedules, call sheets and budgets can be really, really useful. Um, you know, if you're making a narrative based program or a panel show or a new show, a script can help um, your talent like um, understand what's going on and learn their lines and know what to say. Um, shooting schedules are really good if you have multiple locations you want to shoot in in one day or multiple things to set up. It keeps everyone on track and knows what everyone's going to be up to. Um, call sheets are sent out. Uh, a day or two prior to your shoot. If you've got a really big cast and crew, they're really important so everyone knows where they need to go, when they need to meet, and a kind of a brief outline of the day. And a budget might be useful for you if you have a lot of expenses for your shoot. Um, you can easily find templates for all of these online. Just a quick Google search will be really easy. Um, you might need to source crew. I can see some of you have got quite large groups might not need to source crew. Um, but for anyone extra, you can look in a few different places. So we have a production notice board that we run that puts um, volunteers and other people, um, connect them with producers who are looking for um, crew. That's kind of our first protocol if we need anyone. Um, there's a website called starnow.com. You might be familiar with it. There's a lot of crew on there. Um, you can contact RMITV. They're one of our affiliate groups. Um, they're mainly t um, RMIT film and media students um, that are looking for work. And you can also look at other film and TV courses at other universities or even other film and TV crewing pages on Facebook for crew. Um, when you do hire a new crew, um, it might be important to ask for a showreel, a resume or a filmography list to kind of get an idea of what their skill level, what they're good at, what they're not so good at. Um, and when we do have a large crew, um, we kind of need to look after them. Um, so providing food and water throughout the day if it's a really, really long shoot is kind of um, super important. And being open and honest with your crew about what you expect from them and what they expect of you is really good as well. Um, and trusting your crew members to do what you ask them to do. Um, nobody likes a producer who steps on everybody's toes. So, you know, putting a trust in your camera people to do the camera work and your audio people to do the audio work, um, it's super important. You can make your shoots as fun as you like. You can make them, you know, as long as you plan and make them really efficient, it'll be fun for everyone. Um, that's pretty much everything to do with producer basics. Did anyone have any questions about any of that straight up at all? No? Everyone's across all that? Cool. Um, well, producer in our terms kind of just means somebody who um, who is liaising with us, who's submitting the programs, who we can send contracts to. They don't necessarily have to call themselves a producer. It could be the director of the show. It could be the editor of the show. We just need one person that we're in contact with um, to do with you know everything about the show, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're uploading to online, um, you can definitely put as much advertising in it as you like. Um, for us, that'll all have to be cut out. Um, you can buy sponsored segments and on sell them onto your sponsors for profit if you wanted to. Um, we can send out more information about costing and stuff for that, but within the program we can't have any advertising or anything like that, yeah. After it's been broadcasted, you can put them in online. Or yeah, definitely. So if you want to add a sponsored segment into your program once you upload it, that's totally fine, yeah. Yeah. Um, on the internet you can do whatever you want. We're not in control of that, so yeah, it's whatever you want to do with that. Can we use the same clip which you guys, you guys broadcasted on the TV or we can use our... Um, so will the, the sponsored segment? Yeah. 
for the one. Say we've given you the clip for yep. 22 minutes. Yep. So we're gonna we're gonna put them on the YouTube or something. Yeah. Do we need to get it from your? Back from us again? Oh, yeah. No, you just keep a copy for yourselves okay. and you can upload it whenever you want. You can do it before it airs with us, you can do it after, that's totally up to you. Um, you can do it all at once. If you've done a whole bunch of episodes and they're slowly going to be airing over a few weeks with us, you can upload them all at one time. It's totally up to you. Uh, the other thing with socials as well, we broadcast and send deaf on TV. Um, for socials, you can go as high as you want in terms of resolution. So you can oh, do yeah. 1080. Um, so if you've got a higher resolution copy, it's always better to use that for your social media. Yeah, that's where so my name comes from because we just want to do the high. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the thing is, we can accept up until 720p for broadcast, which we then down can, uh, downscale to standard deaf. Yeah. But you can go full 1080 for web, or if it's a 4K platform, you're shooting 4K, you can even go 4K. That's an, issue, uh, an option. So, that, yeah. Cool. Any more? Yeah. What, what about the copyright of the video we made? In copyright? Okay, so it's probably best to avoid copyrighted music um, in general, especially even copyrighted segments. If you're making a new show and you're talking about uh, you know, an event that's happened and you use a segment from another new show, that's usually passable, as long as it definitely is a new show. Um, music we try and avoid, and there's other bits and pieces. Matt can probably expand on this a little bit more. Um, yeah, I think unless you own the content yourself, it's probably best not to use it. It's just as long as you own it, then you know you're not going to have any issues, especially going towards digital. If you're looking at putting things on YouTube and you don't own the content, it'll get flagged and it'll get taken down. So the more stuff that you own, the better. And once you've created the content, you own it. So that way, even with, if you broadcast with us, you still own the content, we just broadcast it. So it's still something you'll own the copyright to without an issue. Um, if you are looking for music um, for your programs, there's a lot of copyright free YouTube channels you can download music from. Um, there's websites you can pay subscriptions for, for copyright free music and even um, stock footage and things like that. So that's just um, kind of avenues that you might need to explore yeah, to see. Yeah. That's what we are doing at the moment. We just pay some sites to get the music. Music for free, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we normally use, uh, there's a YouTube channel that it's um, all downloaded. Um, you can face, yeah, straight yeah. download from there, and it's all copyright free. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 definitely. And it's always yeah. really easy to get it from there yes. because, yes. yeah. Yeah, and I think YouTube even has a copyright free music library that you can use if you upload you'll to YouTube. You'll be surprised, you'll actually hear a few of them on like, if you listen to a show on Foxtel, you'll hear that song pop up. There's a couple of times I've been listening to an ad or been watching a show, and I'm like, I know that song, it's, I've spotted on that copyright free yeah. channel. So yeah. um, they're quite popular between anyone that's sort of creating content. So, yeah. Yeah, we might move yep. on to some technical kind of stuff. Yeah, so focus is something that's really important um, for capturing stuff. A good way to do it is to zoom in as much as you can and make sure that the eyes are really clear and in focus and you can see what's going on. Um, and then once you zoom out, everything else should be in focus, um, right from you know the person you focused on all the way backwards. Um, anything forward of that might fall out of focus. Um, that's uh, something really important. But Moving on to these, these are the two kind of cameras you'll probably be using the most. Um, this is a broadcast quality camera. Um, I need my notes. <laughs> um, so our studio cameras in here are broadcast quality. Um, they're kind of all in one unit. Um, you can plug audio into them. The camera, the lens is fixed and can't be changed. There's a lot of settings in there. Um, it's a really good all in one package. Um, although they can be um, pretty expensive um up to a few grand per camera um so it kind of depends on your budget Alex, what's the range for that for this yeah. Yeah, i'm not 100 percent sure matt how much do you reckon something like this would be brand new but yeah you can get them second okay. it's about four and a half thousand brand new i think um you can get them second hand yeah. off ebay quite cheap okay. um yeah that's probably if you're looking for cheaper gear, there is a lot of that sort of stuff that does get mm -hmm. resold on there mm -hmm. um, and it's a good, yeah, good option. Yeah. Um, another option that's a little bit cheaper is a DSLR, which is this one over here. Um, so they come in a few different brands like um, Canon and Nikon and Sony. Um, they're primarily a photography camera. A lot of them do have video settings, can shoot right up to 4K. Um, they have changeable lenses, so you can change those depending on the kind of look you want, uh, the zoom, that sort of stuff. Um, they're pretty portable compared to these, like the form factor is a lot smaller. They're a lot easier to take around if you're shooting out. <laughs> um, if you're shooting out on location, they're a lot easier to pack up. Um, 
you, unfortunately, you can't record really record audio into them. This one will take two different channels. So if you've got two people doing an interview, you can plug both microphones into one. Whereas with this, you can only really plug one in. Some of them don't even take any audio at all. Um, so you have to record that separately. Um, but there's less settings on a DSLR compared to a broadcast camera. Um, so it kind of depends on what sort of content you're making. Um, and then, we yeah. Can just film. Yep. And we can interview the people. Yep. But we have to get the audio set up slightly in a slightly differently. Way. Yeah, so I'm going to go through audio in a okay. minute. Let's maybe this show this quickly. Yeah. So this here is a touch cam, and this is an external recording device. So you can plug in just into here. Um, you can see there's a couple of XLR points. You plug in. There's uh, a cable and a. Yep. Oh, this. Yep. So we have that, and that'll plug this side this side into here and this side into your microphone. So whether it's a boom mic or a uh, shotgun mic, which is which just over, just in the ground here. So whether it's this type of mic or a boom and you can plug that into there and that'll work. So you can record that externally from your camera and that's probably your best bet with that one there. Um, another thing that's super important is lighting as well. Um, so this is an LED panel. This is probably the best bet for anyone. Um, you can pop them on a stand. You can screw them onto the top of your camera as well, both DSLR and broadcast cameras. Um, they're battery operated. You don't need to plug them into the wall. Really, really portable. Um, you can change the brightness of them. I don't want to do this too much because I don't want to stuff up the camera. But, you know, you can change the... Mate, you're in the way, sorry. Actually, let's point it at someone, just so maybe you can point it at me and you can see how it does. So, so if you can all look at the floor monitor, yeah. you can see how I'm quite bright on this side. Turn it down yeah. so you... Should turn the mic on. Um, if you turn it down, so there's a little... You can actually change how bright it is as well. Yeah. And the further away you move it, the better it will be. So the idea with these types of lights is to set it up at a 45 degree angle. So we'll put it where that camera there is actually, Alex. And so you point that at me and you'll normally lift it so it's in line with their face, um, which is probably the best, best bet. And you can see that I'm quite bright now here. You'll have a few different lights normally. So you'll have one, of, maybe two of these. So you set one up there and one up there. So that way you can light them evenly. So I'll be lit from this side and from this side. Um, lighting is really important, but what's probably even more important is that you don't overexpose. So you can see how bright my face is on there. Um, <laughs> if yeah, and you lose a lot of detail. So that can also be changed in your camera itself. Um, I adjusted it so that it's lit, so that this is non-existent for this space. So if I turn that off, you can see I'm a little bit pale, but that's just not because of the lighting, but because of myself. So you also adjust the person's skin tone. So in my case, you might need to give me a little bit less light because I tend to reflect a bit more. And yeah, depending on who you're shooting, um, always adjust their skin tone as well because you want to make sure that they're lit properly. Uh, their clothes, if they're wearing white clothes, it's also really tricky with that. You want to make sure that if they are wearing white, it's going to reflect a lot. So if you have a look at Alex and myself standing side by side, so if you want to jump next to me, yeah. Alex is a white top. I have a dark top. Hers is reflecting quite a bit and mine isn't so again you're adjusting to their actual face rather than their clothing but in some cases you might want to bring it down a little bit so it doesn't look as um overexposed on the clothing as well so yeah Just a question yeah uh, in the studio setting what do you think are the best color temperatures for um Oh, that's really so hard to say. It kind of depends on the look you're going for. Yeah, it also depends yeah. on the lighting that you're using. So, for example, we've got the white light. That's at 5,100 um, camera two, so I manually white balanced that earlier. Um, it's lost connection to the CCU. So I guess if you're using yellow light, it's going to change as well. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's white lighting, yeah, about 5,100, 5,600 is pretty good. Um, most of the LED panels got the temperature at the back. Yeah, yeah so, so this one other, does. Yeah, so you can actually change that. So depending on what setting we're in, we can actually turn that to yellow. So just point to that camera there, Alex. Oh, there we go. Yep, so if you change that over, you can see that it's gone from white to yellow. And the other thing you don't want to do is mix colors. So if, if you're on a shoot and you're shooting out in daylight, you don't want to be using a yellow light, which brings me to gels, which do you still have them here? Oh, no, so gels... Wait, one second, I'll go grab the gels and come back. I'll explain what they are. Um, gels are colored bits of plastic you can pop on the top of the light. Um, sometimes this one would be considered a clear gel. They're not, sometimes they're hard plastic, sometimes they're like a cellophane. 
they can pop on over your light um, and change it from tungsten to daylight, so different colour temperature. You can also get different coloured ones, pink, blue, green, if you wanted to have different coloured light to make a different look. Here's Matt with the gels now. And there's also diffusion paper, um, which can change the light and make it a bit softer. Um. And then um, neutral density filters, if the light's really, really bright, you can't turn it down, you can pop them over the top as well. What um, that's also really important for is if you're using halogen lights or something that gets quite hot, um, you need to put that over the gel because it will melt the gel. I've so done that before. I've burnt the, through the paper before, so <laughs> just keep an eye on it. If you smell smoke, it's most likely that's what's burning. But depending on what you're doing, there's blue and yellow. So the blue will be if you're using a yellow light and want to change it to a daylight. And the other way is if you're going to tungsten. They like to stick together. This one is stuck together. So this one's already got the paper on there from last time. Somebody use it just so it doesn't melt. And you just put some pegs on the barn doors if you've got them. Yep. And that's Close generally the best way to go about it. Um, yeah, don't use anything plastic. You, it depends on your space. If you're shooting indoors and you're using the natural light of the room and you can't change the lighting. So for example, you're shooting that hallway out there. It's quite yellow. So in that case there, you're probably going to use the yellow lighting. Um, you want to light the, if you're having to use that, ideally you don't use natural light, you light it with your own lights. Okay. But in some cases you might want more light in the room and the best way to use that is to use natural. If you have a look at the top corner of the room here, do you notice there's a blue gel on the back wall? Yeah. So they're, na they're yellow lights. We wanted a bit more light in here. Yeah. So we just threw the gel on top and we turned that on just to give us a little bit more in the back space of the room, which kind of bleeds through. Right in front of you, you can mm. control this. Right yeah, so I can actually, Alex, if you just stand there, I yep. will adjust the lights for you so you can have a look. So we have a lighting desk in here, and if we were setting up a three point lighting setup, I'm just going to close all these lights so we'll go a bit dark. And we have at the moment two soft boxes. Um, that's pretty good if you're straight on, but you can see Alex is kind of lit from the front, but she's kind of dim all around. So if you want the actual space to give, have a bit more of a pop, We'll close one of those off. So there's our one light. If Alex is standing just here, can I get you? And I'll just move this. Yep. Bit. So she's standing just there. And we would bring <coughs> on a backlight. And we need another light to light her from the front. So uh, it would be this one just here. I think it's number one. Yeah. So you can see now she's kind of lit from three spots. One there, one there, one there. Yeah, so you might still need more light. Yeah, yeah. So that's in that case, you might be like, okay, we want more light in the room. Let's turn them all on. But what might happen is the room lighting could be the wrong color. And if it is, that's why you have to have the either, if you're using that LED, you change it to whatever kind of suits the color temperature. Um, light meter is always really handy as well. It's something that's kind of not used as much anymore. But if you have a light meter, you can just kind of point it at the camera and it actually gives you the f-stop reading and it can give you also the color temperature. So it means you can actually adjust it to whatever that color temperature is. These are more sort of a white, like a yeah. neon light, but yeah. you could also use something more sort of yellowish. Yeah. LED that is yeah. Uh, sort of. Yeah, we've got. Um, less pale. So I yeah. think uh, nowadays most of the lights. The LED lights comes with the color temperature. Yes. The chain, yeah. For yep. two hundred dollars, the panel like that's yep. got a built-in temperature. You don't need those gels. Yeah, which is what these ones here yeah, are, and yeah. so it's a lot smaller. But we've yeah. also got some new LED lights which are quite yeah, large, but they've actually got a LED. diffuser that comes with them, yeah, so yeah. you can just throw it over and it changes yep. the lighting. Um, yeah. So, but if you are using an older style of light because style. that's what you've got, it's always handy to have a set of gels with you. So some other accessories you might want to use are, well, tripods are super important to hold your camera. Um, lenses for DSLRs, so this lens will come off, you can change those over. Um, light stands like this one. Reflectors, I forgot to grab one, but it's basically a big fold-out circle that's gold on one side, silver on the other. If you don't have enough lights and you're outside, or even if you're inside, you can use it to bounce light onto somebody's face. They usually have a zip-off zip off cover which turn into a diffuser as well. So if you're outside and there's really bright sun, you can hold it up and diffuse the light. Um, and sandbags as well. I have one here. Um, so pretty much a big black bag full of sand. They're good to put on your light stands since they're very light. They're very prone to falling over. Um, they're good to put on so no one's going to knock them over or hurt themselves. Um, Just so drop it in between the legs. So pretty much, I don't want to do it to this one because it'll no, break. No, do it, do it, it's fine. Are you it sure? Okay. Yeah, if, just be careful with it though. So well, you want to kind of put it on fit, a 45. But oh, I can do it, hold on. Kind of goes underneath or over the leg. Hold up. Oops, sorry. 
That's okay. I'm just <laughs> worried about breaking. It's pretty flimsy. Just drop oh, it. Okay, right, right. Yeah. 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 Oh, there. And try, try and balance, kind of balance the weight so you don't yeah. put too much on weight on one or the other. I haven't put it all the way through because yep. yeah. But normally you kind of put it on there. Just a good, some good things to remember is there's um, some cameras you want to try and avoid using. So no phone cameras, no handy cams or GoPro slash action cameras, unless you really need, like if you're doing something that's outdoor recreational, you want to use a GoPro, that's fine. But we just like to avoid them. These cameras look a lot nicer. And as we mentioned before, exposure is always really important. It's easy to yeah. be overexposed. Um, so always bring it back. You, sometimes you're better off going just a touch under than over because you can always probably bring it back in post. Where if you go over and lose too much information, if you're using some of these production cameras, then you basically lose all your footage. Um, and in saying that, yeah, white balance as well is super important um, yeah. to make sure that everyone, the colours in the frame look right. Um, something that's also quite handy with white balance, take a white piece of paper with you for the white balance anyway. But if you actually start recording with that in shot, you can actually fix it in post by picking up the white in the frame. So you can use a drop tool to do a colour correction um, post. Mm -hmm. And by having white, so you, before you even start, just have whoever's holding it, hold it up, record for about 10, 15 seconds with all the lighting set up, give it back to whoever it is, and you can actually grab that 10 or 15 seconds to colour balance the whole video. So that way, if you do happen to make a mistake on the day, that's a bit of a safety, so you're not having to muck around with it for half an hour trying to get it right. Cool. Um, I think we'll move on to audio now. Um, so there's about three different kind of microphones you might be using. Um, so I'm wearing a lapel light mic at the moment. They're really good for interviews. They just clip onto the shirt, underneath, onto the collar, anything like that. Um, and they come with a pack, as you can see on the back, um, which is a transmitter, and your receiver plugs into either your camera or your external recorder. Um, you can pop them on as many people as you need to. Um, shotgun mics are like these ones, which is just like a long microphone with a cover on it. Um, you can pop them onto boom poles as well. Um, they're kind of good for outdoor sort of stuff, um, some kind of atmosphere kind of things as well. Um, you can also mount these onto the top of the camera. Um, a lot of broadcast cameras have this kind of opening through, they slide through and just sit on there. Um, good to pick up uh, as a safety in case your other microphones drop out. Um, and then if you're kind of doing maybe really short on the street interviews, kind of vox pops or anything like that, handheld mic's really good. Easily point it towards whoever you're talking to. You can hold it. Um, a lot of people like to put their branding of their show on the microphone as well, um, just to kind of, I guess, remind people what they're watching. Question, so let's say you've got two people wearing lovely mics. Yeah. Since they're typically omnidirectional, how would you prevent the phase issues in my colleague? I'll pass that one on to you, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> um, so, obviously, if you're using one of these, you've got your left and your right channel. Um, if you've got one on the left and one on the right, if it's coming through the same camera source, it should come in sync. So you're not going to have any weird echo noises. So normally, if you're recording on two separate mics, it might be like a slight frame out, and you do get that weird um, echoey noise. So best bet is to drop one in each channel on the same mic, uh, sorry, on the same camera to get the, um, the feed out. Uh, just another thing in general as well, headphones, they're really handy so you can hear it before you even start. So if you can hear anything coming through weirdly, you can at least go back here and go, okay, what's kind of going on? Uh, it could also be that you're getting the same channel through twice. Um, so on this camera here, if I turn it around, you can see there is a left and a right channel just there. And if you're feeding through the left channel twice, it will generally uh, come through left and right mix. That's kind of handy if you're only recording one person because then what you can do in that case is drop one channel a little bit lower. It's a safety for your audio, so that way if you do happen to have someone that kind of goes from really soft to really loud, all of a sudden and it starts to distort, you've got that safety um, at the back end. But to answer the rest of that, um, basically I think it's if you're recording the same device, it generally avoids it as long as they're kind of from here to here. If they're staying side by side, it still tends to avoid it. Like our studio, um, they they sit from wet outside and oh, you don't generally have that problem where it's going to pick it up. It's also probably the mic you're using. Um, probably worth checking it out before you purchase it if you're going to buy it and uh -huh. try to get a couple and test them out when, you, when you're there with your camera. Give it a listen. Um, but yeah, if you've generally got a camera with two record sources, that's probably the best, best course of action because it can't possibly have that slight delay between one and the other, which has happened a few times with programs much they can do it's not their own fault it's just the way that it records out and obviously check your frame rates the same um, if you're recording one camera at 25 and one camera at 50 um, it's 
slightly different or if you record it, don't record at 30 frames because you don't really want to be recording, recording NTSC. Um, so 30 or 60 is out, either 25 or 50 is probably your best bet. And yeah, just make sure all cameras, if you're using multiple, are all set to the same format before you record. And that should, that should hopefully fix the problems. You know that wireless receiver? Yes. Uh, some of them, they got, this comes with uh, two centers. Mm -hmm. So like say she is wearing one and yep. you can have another one on your pocket. So that's mm -hmm. not going to interfere with the recordings, right? That's a good question. I so don't think so. One, two centers. No, shouldn't. I think, I think, oh, actually, it's a good question. Um, I don't know. I would be worth I've trying. I've never done that before. Yeah, I don't think I've ever tried that either. It would have to be on the same frequency. So you purchase uh, with, uh, that comes in uh, one receiver. Yeah. Center, so if you're doing interviews, kind of drama activities. Yeah. Uh, so far it's worked well, but okay. you didn't yeah. do any homework yet. Yeah, no, yeah, I, no I think it's always, yeah, I, if it's taken on the same frequency, I'm assuming it's just going to receive the same audio. Mm -hmm. So it's take it from both, both sources and not, not split it. So take both in and yeah. that's probably, yeah. So I'm assuming, like, from your telling me, without actually having used it, it sounds like it'd be quite handy. Um, yeah. Because at least you know that you can mic two people up and you're going to get the same audio. Well, sorry, audio at the same time. Audio. Yeah, the only yeah. thing is that might be tricky with that. Um, unless they've actually got internal volume on each one, you're going to make it. Yeah, because otherwise you're going to probably have the issue where you go to set the audio for one person, but like Alex and I are speaking at different levels. Um, mm -hmm. If yeah, you g it's you're gonna lose audio on someone, or someone's gonna be really loud and clipping. Yeah. Yep. So that's the only thing I can think of that could possibly go wrong with that. But as long as it's got an internal, yeah, it should be fine. Most of them got internal the DB value that we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, my yeah. okay. background, I'm an audio engineer. Okay. Yeah. And I work with sound a lot. Yeah. yeah. My background is uh, yeah, and uh, in, in cheap sound systems, come up is a, a dual receiver. It's look like a one unit, but it's actually a dual receiver. It's set up two different channels for it to go in. If you try to set up one frequency mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and with um, two uh, mic or two belt pack, whatever, just tune it into the same frequency, yeah. it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you start to hear all the, all the, uh, all the squeaky noise and interference and dropping yeah. in and out, which mm -hmm. causes a lot of problems. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. They try to avoid it. They both carry, I think it's not just a frequency, but it's also the transmitting frequency is carried within the signal. So it's have to be match, mismatch, yeah. and it is only allowed. It's very tight. It's very secure. It's only allowed one sound, one frequency coming in. Yeah. You try to avoid all the interference around it. Mm. All. Yeah. Mm. So if, if you yeah. try, if you go in there, you've got two microphones. You both switch on and tune in with one frequency, one receiver. Yeah. You find that you will have a problem most. Mm. Probably, I probably think because we didn't test it out mm. that. Um, and properly, but it came as a package. One it, okay. it could be just that you've got a backup in case one's broken. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, I can't tune my microphone into Alex's frequency, so I'll just make sure this up here. I can't tune my microphone into Alex's frequency because it will interfere, but in this case here, there's two frequencies on here, which is what each of those are. So they've got two separate frequencies. And yours are probably the same if it was sold like yeah, that. Yeah, so that's yeah. definitely okay. It's, it's, only, it's only if you tune them into the exact same frequency you're going to have the issue. Yeah. Those ones are very good. That the, the sender, you can attach those mics directly onto it. Yeah. So rather than running cable from your camera, yeah. you can attach directly mm -hmm. to that. So yeah. It's very convenient. Yeah. And that's just kind of what we got here. We've got a, um, we have a couple of those lapel packs, but we've got one of these as well. So, and that's just the handheld version. Uh, it's the exact same. It's the Sony. Same brand, and yeah. yeah. Except with this, it's just, one frequency, so yeah. you need, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it still connects, yeah. Um, what do you got next? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Going back to like wide microphones, um, say you're in a studio setting, yeah. so wouldn't a shotgun mic, which is directional, which would reject everything else behind it, wouldn't that be better compared to a lavalier? If uh, you're pointing it directly at the person. So it depends. it depends on your space. The question is, what is the pro and con between these? So the con with that one, it has to be right where you're talking. If you don't get it in the perfect spot, it will sound room echo. And it's really tricky. You have to set it up. It has to be perfect. If you like, if you have someone mic'd up like that, uh, you know that it's going to come out sounding OK because of where it's positioned and you've got more control over it. Whereas if they're moving side to side, you've got control over it if they're wearing that. If they're dead still, 
it's generally okay. If we're setting up a green screen back here, we generally use that and have someone stand on the exact point we want them. So we're like, okay, let's just drop you down. Kind of stand here. All right, sweet. Drop that down. Yep, cool. It's right where they are and do a sound check. It's also, because it is directional, um, if it's too far away, it's not going to pick up enough audio. So where this here is, because it's just from here to here, it's going to be fine in terms of not being, well, yeah. I wouldn't personally, booming's good if you're outside. Um, if you've got one of these, windsock. Um, it's or really a dead cat. Yeah, it's really <laughs> important to have these because otherwise you're going to get a lot of wind noise and it's going to not sound right. I tend to use a handheld as well if it gets really windy because sometimes I find that that picks up too much wind. Um, but again, in a studio situation, they're quite, they're probably the best, best bet. Um, yeah. Um, yep. So, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, it just depends on how windy it is outside. So if, if it's really, really windy, you, you know, this is probably the best to cut out the wind, although you do lose some of the volume. Um, with just like a foam blimp, you do reduce the wind noise, but it kind of picks up everything a little bit easier because it's not got as much deadening to go through. Um, so it kind of just depends on the environment you're in. We kind of tend just to use blimps inside. Yeah. Um, very rarely do we just use a plain microphone. It's way too easy for this to pick up any sorts of noise. Even people walking past the breezer that can can be picked up on the mic. So at least having a phone blimp cuts all of that out. Super windy days, definitely, definitely a dead cat. It's commonly known as a dead cat because it's very fluffy and cat shaped, I guess. I'm not sure. Um, in saying that, uh, speaking about audio as well, with externally recording, it's super important to make sure that you sync everything properly. Um, you can use a slate, which are, you know, the the clapper things with the we don't have one um, with the clappers on top, and you can write with the shot number and stuff. You don't have to have one of those. You can just stand in front of the cameras, have a microphone, and just clap. Um, when they take it into audio, that's simple enough. Um, it's also a really good idea to kind of say what you're doing or for the if you're interviewing someone ask the interviewer to say can you just say your name and where you're from when you go into editing you'll remember which part goes with what person and that sort of thing just some um, really simple tips yeah but before also when you were saying about slight delays you tend more to get a delay out of this than you would straight into the camera because mm -hmm. it's automatically um, the audio is going to sync up so you don't have to stress too much so if only if you're using DSLR probably easier if you a recorder or you're doing a massive event and they've got a stage it's probably worth getting that plugged into their sound system so it's really handy to have that and then obviously you'd still record in camera and you can always sync it up later if you've got um, Atmos and that sort of stuff you want to add in so what has the as well for uh, no but what happens is if it's just um, yeah it does have it should record in the frame rate um, yeah it does yeah so same bit rate you can set the bit you can yep 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 um, and just some microphones we want to avoid. So most microphones have built in, uh, most cameras, sorry, have built in microphones. We don't want to use those, they sound terrible. Um, a microphone from a phone, so headphones. Before we jump ahead, yeah. however, I would, if you're recording multiple cameras, I would use the camera mic on the, or a, just one of these plugged in um, on the secondary camera. The reason you want to do that is because if you're recording, and this has happened multiple times, I've had to try and do it, it's an absolute pain. If you're recording multiple cameras and you have to sync it in post and you're not recording any audio on the secondary camera, it's a real trouble to try mm. and sync it up. At least yep. if you're recording some form of audio, even with this camera, uh, one, it's a backup source of audio. So worst case scenario, if the other audio has gone wrong somewhere along the way, um, you've always got that as a backup. And two, if you have got that audio, it's really easy to kind of go, okay, that's where the clap is, that's where they're talking, there's our sync point. Cool, yeah. So don't use them for actual shooting, use them yeah. as backup. Um, so yeah, the microphone out of, it, out of your phone, the microphone that might be on headphones or earbuds, don't use those either, they sound terrible. Um, that's pretty much all we have everything to go through. Was there any other questions about anything really we yeah, can answer? Specific cameras that you recommend, DSLRs? Uh, DSLRs, I think yeah, Kelly's probably the man to ask that one. I prefer the DSLRs or cinema quality cameras to shoot with. Yeah, what brand? Oh, what brand? This is a Sony. I like Canon. 
Um, Canon's really easy to find lenses for, really easy to find accessories that go with. They're pretty popular. Yeah. Nikon's also pretty popular. The Sony's have a different look to them. They have more of a cinematic look, so it depends on what you're shooting. Um, if you did have a budget, it might also be, you might want to look at something like a Canon C300 or C100. Yeah, Canon C200. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a pretty good uh, cinema camera. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. more of a cinema camera. They look really, really nice. I've used them before. They're a lot smaller than even your broadcast camera. Yeah. Super portable. You can throw all your extra bits on there if you want to. It just kind of depends on your budget, really. Uh, sorry, you had a question as well? Uh, in terms of equipment, yep. Yep. can you rent or lease from C31? So not directly through us, but you can go to RMI TV. I know they do rental of gear, um, and they tend to have a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Um, yeah, a lot of DSLRs and things so like that. They've got similar style cameras, they do have DSLRs as well and they've got recording equipment that you can rent from them. Unfortunately, um, we don't have the insurance to be able to le lease out cameras, so we can only use them for our own shoots um, to hire them out. We're not covered, so if it gets damaged or anything like that, even though we expect it wouldn't, um, you never know, those accidents happen, um, we won't be covered for it, we're at least if we're out on location we're using it, we've got the insurance, so we can't unfortunately rent out equipment. Um, and there's lots of um, gear houses in all around Melbourne that will hire out gear. It'll be a little bit more expensive than RMI TV, yeah. um, but they have a lot bigger range with cameras and things like that. So, a question over here? Anyone? So, is that, is that the, uh, the, the screen? So, this so is, yeah. Yeah, that's an extra monitor. So, you can actually attach that. So, you're not using the really small one. So, you can actually add an extra um, large monitor and a visor. So, you can use that to what, uh, watch what you're doing. And you can also attach a gimbal. I don't know if the monitor will sit with the gimbal. I think it no, no, only the camera with the gimbal. Yeah. And um, that's just gimbals actually to get smoother movement. So you can get a motorized, um, like a handheld tripod, which can actually move oh, slowly. Are those thing with the wheels? Uh, um, similar. It's sim basically. Do you want to go and find a gimbal? Uh, I don't know where it is. It's you, it? you hold it down. So you hold it with two hands like this, and you can move it around. Oh, and what happens is it actually does movements. And what happens is it's got a, you can either get a motorized one or an unmotorized one. So if you want to do tracking shots, so you want to walk oh, with it, yeah, 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 you can walk yeah. with that. Oh, um, yeah. I know our, our tech guy, Kelly, he's basically optimized these kits for a shoot he does uh, called Solid All. It's a program we're filming at the moment. Um, so he's kind of gone through equipment and found what kind of suits that in particular. Um, he's really handy to be able to ask these kind of questions to um, unfortunately, he's gone for the night. Otherwise, I would have brought him in and sure. he would have been the guy to ask. But the thing is, if you've got any questions in terms of what equipment to buy, he was actually telling me before, he was at looking online of what sort of stuff would be good for you. Um, so, mics, yeah. in terms of, instead of getting these here, um, he was talking about road mics. And, road um, mics, really. Yeah, good. they've got a new one that's out that's quite handy. So, um, any questions on equipment that you have, just send an email through yeah. and I'll send it to him. He, as I said, he's an expert in this stuff. He kind of looks at it all day, okay. trying to find what's new on the market, mm -hmm. what's really handy, um, mainly because he wants to be able to purchase it for our own <laughs> sort of shoots um, and know what, what's kind of useful at a budget because, again, we don't have the money to spend yeah. spend a lot, so we have to do it at quite a cheaper rate. So, yeah, yeah for budget equipment that works quite well, he's a man. Oh. So, are you good? Mm. Yep. Uh, yeah. When uh, you uh, upgrade your equipment yes. and the only uh, equipment you put in here by you somewhere, <laughs> Good question. Um, so, <laughs> um, this, yeah, this is our, this is essentially our old stuff. Um, our old cameras were basically like this. We then went and got another five of them because we wanted to do outside broadcasting. Um, they're good for what we need for when we do that sort of stuff. But to go out on a shoot, that's a lot smaller of a pack uh, setup. So we needed to expand our stuff for DSLRs. Audio, Kelly will still take this out. He'll record audio on this. Or now he takes the recorder. But even then, to take that as your audio source and then sync it up later. But the other thing is, it depends on what frame rates, what frame rates you're shooting. So you want to keep everything consistent. You want to shoot at the highest quality, but then you also want to edit at the highest quality. So if that's recording one quality and that's recording the other, we still keep it. But if we're going to take it out on a shoot, we'll take out the same cameras. So we don't really sell them off. Um, we Sorry. have <laughs> had donations of equipment before, um, which we have in, in the past gone, OK, it doesn't suit our space. We'll donate to another group, and they, they might be able to use it. Um, but yeah, I think as, as the station, I, we haven't really produced a lot of our own content until recently, probably over the last five years. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the first batch of stuff we bought. We still use it and that's now our upgraded stuff. So yeah. yeah. That one I think was about total, was it about two and a half? Two and a half. So 
the camera body is usually sold separate from the lens. Yeah. Um, this lens, I'll take it off, um, is a pretty standard lens. You can get really wide angle ones if you're doing lots of really wide shots. Um, so essentially it just comes off like that. This body bit sold separately. I shouldn't be putting my back to camera. Um, what is this? Uh, 18 to 135, so it zooms in and out. Um, as you might need to. It's really good for just like interview stuff. <coughs> you can zoom in to do B-roll if you need to, get really close-ups of things. Um, it's got its own aperture function as well. Um, the and advantage of that versus that is it's a lot more portable. The advantage of this over this is you can only, you only have to use the one lens. So it means you're not detaching lenses and re-adding them on because you have to, say, change it over and uh, to get a different depth of field because your, your shot Sorry. changes. Oh this gosh. case here, Oh, hold on, uh -oh. Let me come around and get I will, back yeah, on. Good idea. Um, yeah, so having the one camera, um, it does. You're going to get your audio in there. You're going to get uh, a decent looking shot. Um, it's pretty handy to do that. It, it, it depends on what your needs are. If you're happy just to kind of scale down your production, and a lot of people are going to DSLRs, um, yeah, it's probably the best bet. But it, it also just depends what you're doing. It just means you have to buy a few more bits and pieces, but it's a lot smaller, a lot more compact. In the studio setting for, um, uh, you know, having a panel discussion yep. or a two people interview, yep. um, would we, would we having these equipment suffice or do we need other? That's uh, perfect for a two person interview um, because you've got. For, for an, an, uh, what is it, what do they call it? a green screen, you call it? Yep, like this back here, the curtain. If we move that, it's a green oh. screen. We'll leave it. It's going to be oh. too hard to move now with everyone in here. Yeah, so if you had, had that Take screen, <laughs> um, yeah, you plug into this for the audio. And you would use one of these with a lapel mic, sit them down, and that shouldn't have a problem. That's generally what we do for Solid All. Uh, we send out that with so the lapels. Yeah, for reading news, you know, like tell it. Uh, for reading news, you might want an auto cue, which is one of those. Uh, you yeah, can do. As well for the yeah, so cue. there's a lot of cheaper ways to get one of those now. You can actually just buy a piece of software that goes to a tablet. So you can set a tablet up and just basically have mm -hmm. it scroll through. Yeah. Um, someone operate it that way. Uh, you don't need the laptop and the or the computer and the audio cue anymore, um, which is quite handy. Um, so yeah, if you're doing news content and you want to set up a camera and basically go, yeah, cool, direct to the camera, that will actually scroll. If I set that up now, that will have text scrolling down. You'll be able to read it. Um, that, yeah, it should be fine. Like I think either of these is fine for both of those situations. It's more if you're if you're recording something like sport, I would use this. If you're recording something like a sit-down interview, either is fine. For, our, for us, it'll be recording interviews, um, yeah. festivals, events, yeah. um, those sorts of things. Yeah, DSLR is probably okay. Yeah. The only thing is, as I said, it's just more your audio and being able to get a clean feed yeah. and might need, need and a audio, couple of those. The, the task cam you've yes. got there and the yeah. microphones and all that. Yeah, and that's yeah. it. Okay. So, which you still need the microphones and all that for this, and it's mm -hmm. two channel. Okay. That you just use the task cam instead, and you record it separately, okay. uh, which means you probably want to record something in that anyway, um, just to be able to again sync it up later. Mm -hmm. But um, is it hard to sync it up? Uh, if you've got two bits of audio and you've got a clear snap point, not at all. What we'll do is we'll actually get into that when we do the editing session. Yeah. Um, I'm going to sit there and use a computer and send it to the boardroom, and what can happen is we can do it online as well. Yeah. Um, so if you can't make it physically in, we'll put it online so you can actually tune in at that point in time and ask questions. And what we'll do is we'll set it up. So we'll do a multicam edit. So I'll grab some video that's been shot like this in the studio, which has a simultaneous recording, which means I don't have to worry about syncing it up because it's automatically synced. And then I'll grab some stuff where we've recorded, say on the Tazcam, so maybe some cellar or whatever it might be, and show you, run you through how the best practice is. If you don't have like a snap point, so for example, Alex just clap. Oh my oh, gosh, let again. me do that again. If you don't have something like that where you can physically see, hold that for me. So on that monitor, physically see that, well, it's out of sync because of oh the yeah. delay. Yeah. But you'll hear that come through the microphone and you can actually use that on your audio waveform to make a sync point. So as long as all the cameras are facing the person that's doing that and you're recording initial audio to hear what's leading into it, because you might do it a couple of times, you want to get the right one, it's really, really easy to do. Um, and just so everyone's aware, this studio is, we, you can hire this studio out yep. if you need to. Um, that includes all the cameras, the lights, everything's in here. Yep. Um, we get you to hire a studio tech as well. We have a list of accredited studio techs and they're just here to help you set everything up, make sure everything's running smoothly, record it all for you. Um, and then you can take that footage on a hard drive at the end of the day and take it off and edit it as you need to. Um, we have a lot of shows that come in here and do live shows or they do pre-recorded stuff, take it away and edit it 
um, and give it back to us and we put it on air. So it's another option for you if you don't want to have to go and buy everything straight away, you can come in and use our stuff. It's probably going to be a little bit cheaper, you know, in the first couple of months. The thing is, like, whether you're doing the digital or you're doing the TV, um, the end of the end of the day, the content's mostly going to be the same. We have a couple of restrictions around advertorial. Film it for what you want. You can always cut out if you want to go to a TV landscape. If you have extra content, you can always add that for digital. So if you've got sponsors and you want to keep them happy, film a little bit extra, throw it on your YouTube channel, your Facebook, whatever it might be. It's probably a good way to do it. And we'll get into that um, our third session, which is, we're going to talk more about, pretty much about that sort of video, stuff. But yeah. yeah, if you're filming stuff, film as much as you can and then always take that into post. Oh, don't film too much as well, because when you take it into post, you're going to be sitting there going, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. So it's always, I've always been told um, four times more than what you need. So if you need five minutes of footage and you record 20, it's easy to cut back. But if you're recording like an hour for five minutes, then you're going to be like trawling through it, trying to find what's mm -hmm. actually usable. So yeah, recording, record a lot, but don't go overboard as well. So.